In the 21st century, those who change the world are those who change the culture. They get people in sync, lead tribes, create movements, and generate an energy field where ordinary people achieve extraordinary results. It is absolutely fine to be afraid of missing a deadline or afraid of harming a patient or afraid of, of letting down a colleague. All of those things are okay. Um, it's not okay to be afraid of each other. Right? It's not okay to be afraid of the boss. It's not okay to be afraid to speak up with work-relevant ideas that may or may not be on target. Right? It's, we've got to be willing to take those interpersonal risks. I'm Aga Bayer, and this is the Culture Lab podcast, where you will find ideas and inspiration on how to harness the power of team and organizational culture. I talk to leadership thinkers, culture experts, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of movers and shakers, and together we explore the fascinating topic of culture, leadership, and personal growth. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Or better yet, write a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your followers and friends on social media. For more, check out our archive at www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 60 of the Culture Lab podcast. So I'm super excited today to introduce you to my guest because she's been one of my personal heroes for a long, long time. Her name is Amy Edmondson and she's Novartis Professor of Leadership and Management at the Harvard Business School. She studies teaming, psychological safety and leadership and her work has been published for decades in the most prestigious academic and management outlets. She's also been recognized by the biannual Thinkers 50 Global Ranking of Management Thinkers. And last November, I was lucky enough to meet her in person and see her accept her Breakthrough Idea Reward during the gala dinner. And you can see the video um, of her acceptance speech in the show notes on my website. And by the way, a side note, it seems so distant now, but it was just a few months ago and we'd go to these events, mingle with hundreds of people, shake hands, embrace, exchange pecks on the cheek. And I'm really curious how these events are going to be organized from now on. Anyway, if you like stories of accidental discoveries, you'll certainly love the story of how Amy stumbled on the idea of psychological safety. And we also talk about why psychological safety is so necessary in teams, especially going forward, and what leaders and team members can do to overcome their blind spots and to cultivate a culture that really supports innovation, performance, and healthy growth. So, without further ado, here is Amy Edmondson. Amy, welcome to the Culture Lab. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I want to preface it by saying that I interviewed around 70 people for this podcast. And our main oh. focus, as you know, has always been cultivating a culture where people can do their best work. And a topic that has consistently come up in all of these conversations was psychological safety or the <laughs> opposite of it, the culture of fear. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that our listeners will understand why I'm so thrilled to welcome you as a guest. Thank you again for making the time to chat. Oh, I am really looking forward to it. Same here. So before we explore the topic of psychological safety and its impact on culture, let me ask you the question I always start with. Mm. What were the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person? In other words, <laughs> what made Amy, Amy? <laughs> well, I, I grew up in New York City. Um, I had um, all of my grandparents nearby and cousins and everybody else. I grew up um, in a Catholic family, which was very service oriented, very much um, about making a better world. So I think those were that sort of strong family proximity and interest in a massive um, you know, cosmopolitan city, but with really an emphasis on what can I do to make things better mm. are probably the influences that uh, most shaped me. 
Yeah. And you have, and you are doing that, our paths crossed at the Thinkers 50 Awards Gala. And you were recognized there with the Breakthrough Idea Award. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. And I loved your acceptance speech and particularly one of your closing remarks, which was that this idea has been breaking through for decades. Um, Right? Indeed. Indeed. I, I got a little bit of a laugh out of this being a breakthrough idea award in that it's something that I stumbled into quite by accident more than 20 years ago. Um, and I, I did, I did uh, quite a bit of pretty good research and then other people picked up the construct and did lots of additional research. And so, as I said then, and we'll say again, it's, it's taken 20 years to break through. Mm. And I think it's a really interesting case study in a way, because now everyone is talking about psychological safety, but it wasn't always the case. And I think for some of our listeners who are entrepreneurs or um, creative people or people working in organizations on big ideas that need a lot of time to break through, Mm. um, I, I would really be curious, you know, what kept you going? Because I can't imagine that it has been easy at the beginning. Well, you know, I didn't, it's not as if I just was beating my head against the wall. My, my papers were getting accepted in good journals. I was doing well as a scholar and a teacher and that's my, that's my job. So Mm -hmm. it it wasn't frustrating. I mean, one doesn't expect to get sort of global real world recognition for scholarly work very often. So not getting it wasn't a disappointment. Um, and I also didn't just, I have to, I have to put this in context because it wasn't as if I was just pursuing this one variable and pursuing it doggedly all the time. I was constantly trying to understand what makes organizations today as effective and learning oriented and agile as they can possibly be. And one answer to that broad question is through ongoing, very effective teaming. And, and so I, I spent a lot of time trying to describe and understand what allows people to team up effectively and get complex and especially new things done, you know, innovative things done. And psychological safety is one of the conditions that allows effective teaming. It's, it's not the only condition, clearly. So uh, it's just, as you said earlier, now the the idea of psychological safety is getting so much traction, uh, but it's in it's got to be put in a broader context, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I think the first time I did a deep dive into your work was around teaming when I was working still in PwC and leading mm, a team mm, there. Mm. And I remember we had one of our annual workshops and we talked about how we can work more effectively and I remember sharing with my team the video that you still have on YouTube where you talk about teaming and everyone loved that idea and I think especially for teams in consulting that come together for a short period of time and then they dissolve and then work with other people it was so incredibly relevant and so helpful for us. Oh, that's wonderful to hear and and you captured it exactly right that my what, what I was trying to do was just shift more of the emphasis from the noun team to the verb teaming because it, it just struck me in the research I was doing in organizations in various industries that the stable, well-designed team was increasingly becoming a thing of the past it, mm. because of the nature of work today because we have 24-7 operations or complex and shifting projects, we often have new people joining a collaboration over time and other people rotating off. Or sometimes we have encounters where we just have to come together quickly, um, share expertise, share ideas, and get something done. And there's never a stable team formed in the middle of it. It's just the teaming. Absolutely. And I know that as you were exploring what makes teams effective, you basically stumbled upon this idea of psychological safety. So 
as you said, it wasn't that it was just one idea that you were pursuing, but also it wasn't something that you intentionally sure. um, looked for. It, it kind of happened that, that you discovered it. So could you talk to us a little bit yes, about that? Yes, and, and you describe it well, but I, I was interested in, in a general sense, I was interested in the learning organization. You know, how, how do we learn? And of course, one of the mm-hmm. things that the learning organization needs is the capacity to learn from mistakes. So I was very excited to be invited to join a team of medical researchers who were studying medication errors in in uh, in two local hospitals, and that was just a great opportunity because I thought, well, mistakes, learning, it's all related. I'm going to get in there and I'm going to uh, understand it better. And I wasn't looking for, but I stumbled into by accident, quite profound differences in reporting climate, which I later really will refer to as psychological safety climate. But the that that belief that, sure, things go wrong, and not only should I speak up about them, but I can speak up about them. And the reason people are willing to do that is, of course, they know that the only way to get better and the only way to provide high-quality, safe, error-free care is to catch and correct errors early. And so, you know, it was it was um, it was something that made sense to me. But I, I think I hadn't originally put quite enough emphasis on how hard that is for people in organizations, you know, to speak up about errors. Mm-hmm. Errors are threatening, and especially in a hierarchy, if you're if people who are evaluating you and who are above you in various uh, ways in the status hierarchy, it can be extremely challenging to speak up honestly about things that go wrong. And yet what I was finding was that some units, some teams did and some didn't. And so I wanted to understand that better. Hmm. It's fascinating. And I want to unpack a little bit what you've just shared with us, because as you said, it's, um, it's interesting because it seems like the teams who, you said the teams that seem to be more effective, they reported more errors and they felt like they could talk about those things. Um, and this has been my experience as well, being an employee in organizations and managing people and then being a consultant, that people will very often say, well, I really can't mm-hmm. do that. I can't tell my right. boss this. Why do you well, think it's, this it's, happens? I, I love that you said can't, because that's exactly right. People don't experience it as, ooh, doesn't feel right, or I, sh- I choose not to. They feel it as an impossibility. You know, they, they feel that they just can't speak up with a mistake or a crazy idea or a need for help or any of those things that I would label interpersonally threatening. And yet in others, they can. And as you said, in that, in that medication error study, I had access, I, I distributed a, the team diagnostic survey that was developed by Richard Hackman. It's quite a validated survey. It's, it's been, had, had already been widely used at that time. It still is widely used today. And it assesses various ver- various properties of teams that kind of make them good teams. You know, clarity of goal, appropriateness of, of composition, um, access to the resources they need to do their work, um, available coaching uh, to keep the team on track, and so on. And so I expected going into the study to find that better teams, better led teams, would have fewer errors. I mean, that, that makes sense um, for, for so many reasons. And in fact, that very thing has been shown in the aviation setting, that better teams, better cockpit crews have fewer errors in simulators um, where they can, they can track the errors objectively. And so I, I had hoped to find the, the same thing. Um, and, and when I first got my data, the survey data, and then got to correlate them with the error data, the results seemed to suggest just the opposite. In other words, the so-called better teams <laughs> had higher error rates, which at first seemed you know, very um, surprising and also quite disconcerting. We, we really don't want to have a finding that says, you know, great teams and hospitals, according to this validated instrument, are out there making more mistakes. 
And then it suddenly occurred to me, wait a minute, maybe they're more, you know, maybe more, maybe great teams are more comfortable talking about error. As I thought about it, I, I suddenly realized maybe the better teams understand the nature of healthcare delivery, which is by its very nature, complex and error prone and fast changing, that they understand that error is inevitable. And they also understand that to do good work and keep patients safe, they need to speak up, you know, early and often, they need to work together, they need to be utterly transparent and, uh, you know, not about themselves, but about the work and about the patients. And, and indeed, so that was my new hypothesis was that there were, hmm. that there were differences in workplace culture that contributed to differences in willingness to speak up about work relevant issues. And that that was clearly important, you know, not only for the delivery of good work, but also for ongoing learning and innovation. And it took me a while to um, find a term in the literature that that seemed um, to capture this phenomenon of, you know, very low fear at work, interpersonal fear. So I I then um, wondered whether, because this was just speculative and by accident. And so my next task as a researcher was to figure out whether I could measure this thing, these differences in interpersonal climate. And if so, did teams even within the same organization vary? Because we're used to thinking of corporate culture as homogenous within an organization. Mm -hmm. But I think interpersonal climate, you know, climate for speaking up varies between groups within the same organization because it's very subject to local influences, you know, how, yes. how this group behaves, how this leader behaves and so forth. And indeed, I could measure it. Indeed, it varied significantly across teams. And this second study was in a manufacturing organization in the U.S. And it predicted learning behaviors such as asking questions, speaking up, offering ideas, experimenting. And in turn, it also predicted team performance. Hmm. This is so fascinating. And I, I am so glad that you stumbled upon it because it really did change the way we think about what makes an effective team and what makes an effective organization. And later on, of course, people like Duhigg have come up with, um, Articles that have been read um, uh, to a, to a, um, by by a lot of people um, because of being published in I think New York Times it was for the first time about the Google study and so on and so forth. But if you haven't done that research, I don't think that it would have been possible for these people to popularize those ideas. Um, and finally, we have your latest book in, in our hands, The Fearless Organization. And I love this title. And at the same time, I think it can be slightly misleading. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that you don't advocate that um, we, we get rid of all types of fear or you don't deem it possible even, I, I think. Correct. So tell us a little bit, what is exactly a fearless organization? Well, a, a fearless organization is either a profound exaggeration or or an ideal state that we'll never reach. Um, and yet even that isn't quite right to say it's an ideal state. I want to, I want to clarify that it is absolutely fine to be afraid of missing a deadline or afraid of harming a patient or afraid of, of letting down a colleague. All of those things are okay. Um, it's not okay to be afraid of each other. And it's not okay to be afraid of the boss. It's not okay to be afraid to speak up with work-relevant ideas that may or may not be on target, right? It's, we've got to be willing to take those interpersonal risks. So, you know, maybe, you know, wouldn't it be a very, it would not be a very uh, interesting book title to say, the low interpersonal risk organization, you know, no, <laughs> nobody would buy that book. Uh, so yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, the, fearless, <laughs> the fearless organization is meant to sort of capture your curiosity and then say, okay, mm -hmm. I'd like to know more about that. And what does that mean? Um, but it's, you know, being afraid to miss a deadline, let's say, 
is generally the kind of fear that you can share. And I would say any shareable fear is, is probably okay. You know, when we're, when we're teaming up together to, um, you know, try to do the very best we can because we really care, we don't want to, you know, let somebody down, et cetera, that's okay because we're in it together. It's when that private, lonely, interpersonal fear is quite crippling, and especially in knowledge work. Yes, um, this is this is such an important um, clarification because I think that you know by saying it's okay to be afraid of missing a deadline, it's okay of um, harming a um, to be afraid of harming a patient, and you say shareable fears versus those interpersonal fears where you feel like it's simply not safe to share your opinion. It's such a different type of fear, and. Um, you know, in your book, you say that no 21st century organization can afford to have a culture of fear. So I understand that you mean a culture of interpersonal fear. Um, but why would you say that? Why, why do you feel that, especially now, especially with knowledge yeah. workers, we really cannot afford it? Probably the best way to explain it is to consider the opposing case. So imagine if you will, a task or a kind of work that can be done individually. You know, I do it alone. I don't have to interact with you. Um, transparently, meaning you can look at what I've done and say whether I did or didn't do a good job. You know, it's, 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 it's um, objectively, objective and, and transparent. Um, then you can probably speculate that fear-based management um, will work, right? Because I can just tell you, you know, if you don't get this done, something bad is going to happen to you. I'm not going to pay you. I'm not going to promote you, whatever it is, you know, and I'm afraid and I got to do this myself and you know exactly whether I did it and how well I did it. But now consider how few jobs look like that anymore. Mm. I mean, as you know, as, essentially none nearly all of us are to some degree interdependent with other people. You know, I need to be unafraid to ask for your help, to ask for your input, to run this by you, and so forth. And almost everything we do can be done, I could do even better, you know, if I'm really motivated, really engaged, and really care in ways that you can't command. You can't, you can't, you can't see the difference between, I mean, you might have some sense of it, but you can't see immediately that I have or haven't done my job right. You can't discern the difference between a kind of a six and a, and a, and a nine or a 10 uh, in, in my performance. Uh, you don't know whether I could have put more energy into satisfying that client or whether I could have come up with an even more creative set of ideas. You know, th th those are, those are non-observable performance differences. And so fear has no place in the modern organization, meaning interpersonal fear, because we are interdependent and things are uncertain and things are quite um, subject to our willingness to really engage and, and bring our full selves forward. Yeah. And it's, you know, in the context, especially, I think, of the recent developments, futurists say that the next 20 years will bring more changes for humanity than the past 300 years. So I think that we have so much volatility and so much um, uncertainty that is coming at us uh, from the outside. So if we, on top of that, layer it with interpersonal fears, it, it's just paralyzing. So I can imagine that none of the organizations would be able to adapt to the current environment. Um, if if, if they right. need, what people need to deal with and think about is, oh, how do I basically cover my back here? And mm -hmm. what do I need to do right, to, to be safe and not to lose my job? Right. It's the difference. I mean, if you, if you think about what's required of us, and especially as you point out with the rapid change and the increasing rate of change, we simply can't afford to have some portion of our brains busy reading the tea leaves, you know, busy mm -hmm. trying to figure out 
you know, whether it's okay to say this or say that, that's, that's just, that's consuming brain cells that we don't have to spare. Yes, absolutely. What is your favorite example of uh, organizations where things went wrong? Your book is full of <laughs> fantastic case studies, but I was wondering which one do you feel is the most illustrative of the consequences of not having psychological safety? I, you know, I think the VW Dieselgate comes to mind mm. um, because it's um, it's such a classic story of great ambition. And let's be clear, I'm in favor of ambition. Right? I'm in favor of stretch goals. I'm in favor of companies trying to solve technological and social problems that are you know re really really challenging. And and that was a story of great ambition. They wanted to have a green car that. Um, everybody wanted to drive and that passed, of course, had to pass the regulatory requirements. Um, and the fear-based, especially top management culture um, got in the way because it was clear about what the goal was. This must happen or else. Mm -hmm. and, and literally, executives would say things like, I have your names. You know, there will be consequences. And mm -hmm. And, and so what happened instead of the actual goal, as we all know now, was the development by engineers of software to cheat the regulators, you know, to make it look like the emissions were what they needed to be because technologically they couldn't produce the engine to actually have the emissions where they needed to be. And so think about what it must feel like you know, to be working in an organization where it seems more reasonable to develop software to cheat regulators than to simply tell your boss, this can't be done at the present time. That's yeah. got to be quite painful. And, mm. and the, the, like all of these stories, it looks for a while like it's working. And people seem and organizations seem to be getting away with it. So fear looks like it works. Mm -hmm. And then you know, we set the standards high. We told people there'd be consequences. And lo and behold, they gave us what we wanted. Yes, and. Eventually, mm -hmm. this illusion of good performance will be revealed. Like all illusions, it will be clear <laughs> that it was an illusion, um, a lie. And mm -hmm. then the scandal is, is far worse than, you know, the, the performance challenges in the first place. Yeah. And so would you say, would it be fair to say that's probably one of the reasons that we still have so many fear-driven cultures in, in um, our business environment today is because companies are so focused on short-term results. Because yes. I'm thinking, you know, for a CEO who knows that he's going to, or he or she is going to be there just for two years or three years, probably pushing it a little bit, they can get away with um, getting things done through fear for such a short period of time. It's true. And, and, and to be fair to them, although I'm never a fan of people trying to get performance to look good in the short term, knowing that when they leave, it'll come crashing down. But I think oftentimes the top executives are simply blind. I mean, they don't know. Right. It, it looks like it's working. So they actually believe it's working. They don't necessarily yeah. believe they've set up a time bomb. Mm -hmm. You know, they think, hey, great car looks beautiful to yes. me, you know, the, yeah. and it seems to work and everybody's happy. So so they're not getting feedback loops that would mm -hmm. help them shift their behavior. And then I, I think also they're not thinking it through. You know, they're not thinking through the question of when do you do your best work? It's certainly mm -hmm. not in a state of panic. And it's yes. certainly not in a situation where you can't ask for help when something's not working. I mean, those, those are not the conditions that any one of us would willingly put ourselves in. So it stands to reason we shouldn't put other people in them either. Hmm. So let's talk a little bit about this blindness and how you can prevent that from happening. So putting ourselves in the shoes of a CEO or an executive in an organization, what can you do to prevent this from happening? So basically not really knowing what, what, what's mm. happening because people simply don't tell you that they are faced with problems. You know, in the fearless organization, I quote Mark Costa, who is the CEO of Eastman Chemical, which is a $10 billion global specialty chemical company. 
And he said in, in our classroom, he said, and I just loved it. I wrote it right down. He said, You're, my, my greatest fear as a CEO is that I won't know what's going on. And, mm. and I just, I think that's very wise. And so if, you, if you're aware that it is a risk for you and for the company and for customers, if you're unaware of things that are going on, then you'll be motivated to go out of your way to find out what's going on. And if you really want to find out what's going on, you're going to have to find out through a genuine spirit of curiosity and humility that's going to lead you to ask good questions and listen thoughtfully to the responses. And, mm-hmm. and in many ways, that's, that's the best answer to your question, which is if you really want to know, you don't want to be blind, you don't want to uh, be caught unawares, you've got to be first realizing, I don't know, and then mm-hmm. second, going out to find out, you know, walking mm-hmm. through the plants, walking through, and, and in a, you know, roll up your sleeves, curious, want to know more, want to understand what's going on here. Yeah. And I think also sometimes admitting that I don't know. Oh, because, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, absolutely. you know, I'm, I'm, first of all, you know, you, if you're in an engineering company, your engineering skills are likely not as strong as the people who've just come out of, you know, the top technical schools yeah. and who are doing the real work of the organization. So you ought to be curious, respectful, want to know what's happening, you know, want to learn, want to learn as much as you can about what's possible and just as important, what's not yet possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love that. Um, And that is such a powerful question, I guess, because I hearing from the organizations I work with, probably the most frustrating question for a lot of CEOs is this cannot be done. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they they try to push through it and when they get this answer from their teams they say well it's resistance to change but sometimes as you say right which might be the wrong diagnosis yeah exactly (laughs) you know what it is is that they reflexively interpret the phrase this can't be done as an effort problem rather than Mm -hmm. as a you know state of technology problem you know, mm-hmm. it, it may very well be that, you know, if you're in, in drug discovery, for example, Mother Nature won't allow this right now. Um, yes. If you're in technology, you know, that the, the, the state of, of engine technology isn't there yet. Um, we'd love to be the first ones to get there. Uh, but mm-hmm. the only way to make that happen is through this very learning-oriented, curious, innovative um, culture. And, and to spontaneously diagnose the deficit as an effort problem, meaning people just aren't trying hard enough, is quite human, quite natural, and quite problematic. (laughs) Um, So you've spoken really clearly about what a senior executive can do to start cultivating that culture of uh, psychological safety. And what advice would you have for those of our listeners who are not in a formal position Hmm. of power? Can they do anything? And if yes, what? (laughs) Yes, they certainly can do do things as well. I, mean, I think it's very um, it's very human to sort of think, oh, you know, I'm not I'm not the boss. What can I do? I can't do anything. And yet, anyone can make a small difference in the interpersonal climate where they work. You do that by expressing curiosity. You do it by asking a colleague a question. You can you can also do it by asking a manager a question. I mean. A, genuine, curious question about how you see something. It doesn't have to be a question like, um, uh, you know, uh, you might not want to ask, many people would feel uncomfortable asking their manager, they shouldn't, but they might, you know, what can I, I don't don't know how to do this yet, you know, um, can you help, even though I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm actually in favor of that. But you can always ask, and you should ask, how do you think about this? Like, how are you, how are you seeing this situation? And that, more importantly, can be asked of any colleague, and then followed by really careful listening. Because mm-hmm. one of the biggest gifts that any one of us can give to anyone else is the gift of listening. And mm. when you're listening to someone, you are automatically giving them that little moment of 
safety of room of sa- of safety for speaking up because they're doing it and you're listening and and so I think if people at work were able to more reliably focus on what they can do rather than what they can't do, um, it, it's a very powerful perspective. So sure, mm-hmm. I don't have a magic wand. I can't fix everything, but I can, I can show up, right? I can show up in such a way that lets other people know that I'm interested, that I care. I can take small risks myself. I can share things that I, you know, I, I, I got this idea. It might not be very good. I'll just try it. Right. And then more often than not, people really won't respond negatively. You know, more often mm-hmm. than not, people will respond like, well, that's interesting. I'd like to think about it more or I'm not sure that would work, but hey, cool idea. You know, I mean, it's, it's um, the, the sort of bad things we imagine might happen rarely do. Yes, this is also so, so, so true. And I'd like you to speak to that because I, I'll never forget an experience that I had at one of the companies that I worked for a few years ago. And I was driving um, with a colleague, a younger colleague. I was driving, she was sitting next to me and we were just chatting about things. And then she shared some of the frustrations that she had with um, our team and our company. And when I asked her whether she addressed this issue with a person <laughs> that the problem was, she mm-hmm. said, no, oh, I okay. haven't. <laughs> uh, but, and I said, what, what, uh, what makes you think that she wouldn't be responsive to that? And she said, well, you just don't do those things. It's impossible, right. you know? And, and I know for a fact that this specific person would listen and would be open <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm wondering, where is this coming yeah. from? Because it seemed a little bit like a myth. You just don't do those things. But it was never really tested in reality. Absolutely. Well, the statement, it was never tested in reality, is so powerful. Because I, we are full of assumptions that we're making, some of them consciously, some of them unconsciously, that don't get tested. And in part because there's an asymmetry, right? It, it, we believe if we believe it to be the case that he will act react badly, we don't want to test it. Mm-hmm. Since that's probably right, I just yeah. why why would I want to test it? I mean, why why would <laughs> I put myself through that? Um, and yet, I would argue more often, far more often than not, it, the assumptions we make are are wrong, are overly negative about how other people will react mm-hmm. to our our weakness, our question, our you know mistake and. You know, mo- most people are really delighted uh, to discover that you're a human being too. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they, they, we're, we we actually so appreciate shows of vulnerability in other people, mm. and and so there's this funny asymmetry in that because if we really stopped to recognize that, maybe we'd be willing to take more risks, which would also be the s- same thing as willing to test. Um, these mm-hmm. things. But also, um, Jim Dietert, um, who was a PhD student of mine and now a full professor at UVA, Jim Dietert and I did a study a number of years ago that directly spoke to this issue. And, and we, called, we called it implicit theories of voice, which is rather academic sounding. But it's, it's exactly what we're talking about here, which is these sort of taken for granted beliefs about what's done at work mm-hmm. and what isn't done at work. You know, you, if you have some kind of um, uh, idea that um, things could be done better, you don't tell a boss about it because that boss might think you're criticizing him or her. And that's, you know, so that's an implicit theory. The yeah. implicit theory is that your improvement idea will be felt as criticism and you just wouldn't want to do that. Um, when I in reality, you know, that manager might in fact be delighted by Mm -hmm. your improvement idea or Mm -hmm. not might be neutral who cares right but we we bring this um and jim and i talked about it as a set of implicit theories about what you do and don't speak up about and under what conditions you do and don't speak and you can and we we were able to document a very large number of people holding fairly high scores on those theories and you can step back and realize the impact of that on work, on knowledge work, and especially on innovation work is profound. Hmm. Yes, I can only imagine. I, you know, as you were speaking, I just realized that I personally 
um, have been a victim to, to um, taking those implicit theories as gospel in, in mm. my personal career where I was working for a company in a, a country and then for personal reasons I needed to be in a different country because my husband was moved to, right. to another country. And my assumption was that it was not possible for me to, to move mm -hmm. to that other country and still continue work for the company. So I basically continued oh. going back and forth until, and, and when people ask me, why haven't you talked to your boss? Maybe he would be okay with it. I was just like, no way, this is just not yep. happening. And especially now I'm going for promotion. There's just oh. no chance. <laughs> right. And, right. And then my boss comes to me at some point and he says, listen, I've been watching you for a few months. I think that if you are forced to do this um, longer, you will probably mm. leave us. And I don't want you, so I want oh. you to stay. Right. <laughs> so let's try to figure out a solution that is going to work both for you and for the company. And I was astonished because that just spoke mm -hmm. completely against what I was absolutely 100% convinced right. Right. would never be possible. And so I eventually moved to Italy, still continued to work for that company, and wow. I did get my promotion at the same time. <laughs> well, I like to <laughs> so, say, you know, the, the, the sort of most profound, you know, human shortcoming we have is the belief that we know. It, and the story yeah. you just told is a, a story where you're 100% sure mm -hmm. that your diagnosis of the situation is correct, right? Mm -hmm. You don't see it as your diagnosis. You see it as reality itself. And then yeah. that gets in the way of you challenging it, testing it, getting curious about it, all of that stuff. And it's not your fault. It's like your brain, your mm -hmm. brain is doing that to you. Because I think we have always, we have this bias towards certainty rather than not knowing. So we'd rather jump into a conclusion than stay in this uncomfortable place of trying to figure out what, what really is true. So what is your take on how do you cultivate that mindset of continuously challenging your own mm. assumptions so that your relationship with reality is healthier? <laughs> I, I, it's not easy, right? There's no, there's no simple solution, but I think it's a combination of two things. And one, it's just, you know, it's cultivating a mindset of curiosity, which is not unlike a growth mindset, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. continually reminding yourself that, um, your brain is lying to you, uh, that, it, that it tells you, you know, things like intelligence are fixed and the reality is fixed when in fact, you can always poke at it. You can always go around the other side and see something else going on, right? So that sort of self, um, self-talk and self-reminder to embrace more of a curiosity growth mindset. But number two is cultivate that as a norm in a team or a norm in a, in a workplace, because it's, when you, if you really get serious about how do we challenge reality, that's a team sport. Right? Challenging reality is darn hard mm -hmm. for individuals. But when you and I team up to do it, mm -hmm. we sort of spur each other on. Well, what yeah. if? Hmm, what might happen if we tried it this way or thought about it that way? So it's not only more fun to do it with other people, it's actually more productive. Yes, I love that. So for our listeners, this is a great for, for example, idea of how you can pair up with someone and just see things um, slightly differently by um, brainstorming together and challenging one another, or each other's assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, love that. I uh, know that you don't have that much time, so <laughs> we will need to shift gears and okay. move to the rapid fire questions. And I have five questions for you. <laughs> I'll ask these questions in rapid succession. Okay. And the idea is that you'll try to answer them in under two minutes. I'll do my best. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So the first one is, how do you define organizational culture? The way things are around here. Culture and is... What, yeah, mm, sorry. Uh, it's all right. And what would be the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? For me, the most important sign is tiptoeing. And, and I don't mean literal tiptoeing uh, up on your toes, but a sense of... It's palpable when there's a sense of caution, a sense of wait and see. I can't just jump in. I mm. need to read the tea leaves. Mm -hmm. And are there any companies that you admire for their culture? And if yes, why? I admire Pixar for its culture. It has cultivated a culture of speaking up and candor and creativity and and um, willingness to get it wrong in service of getting it right eventually. 
Mm. Are there any books on culture or on leadership that you would recommend? And I would certainly, by the way, recommend your books and we'll put links to, to your books in the show notes. Uh, but who inspires you or who do you learn from? Well, I love the book, The Culture Code by mm -hmm. Daniel Coyle. I yeah. think it's um I think it's one of the best books on culture. I mean, just absolutely readable, engaging, page turner, wonderful book. Mm. Oh, well, great stories. Yeah, I, I love it too. Mm. And what is one thing that our listeners can do tomorrow so that they build their own culture lab and start cultivating the sort of culture that will help them and their teams to bring their vision to life? Force yourself to ask two good questions every day. And, and, and one good question should be the kind that help us go deeper. You know, what, mm -hmm. why do you think that? Ah, you know, mm -hmm. what might happen if? And one good question should be the type that help us go broader. Like, what other options are there? What might we be missing? Who has a different perspective? Oh, I love that. Deeper and broader. Love that. And finally, um, what are your final thoughts? What would you like to leave our listeners with? I would like to leave your listeners with the awareness that they are so much more powerful than they think in terms of making a difference in other people's culture and at, at work, right? So you can show up how you show up matters, show up, bring your full self forward, be interested in what others are thinking and doing and feeling and um, go ahead and make that difference. Mm, that's wonderful. I can't think of a better way to end this. Um, and I want to thank you again for the work that you've done over the past decades, because I really think it's been game changing for organizations. And um, it's been incredibly helpful for so many people, so many organizations that I know of, who are now more aware of the fact that psychological safety is important and also have tips and guidelines and ideas from you and from your colleagues on how to cultivate it. Uh, so thank you. And please keep doing this work. You are welcome. And I so appreciate your interest. Um, and if anyone would like to learn more about what you are up to and what you are working on at the moment, what is the best place for them to visit online or offline? Well, on the mom at the moment, the best place is to go to the Harvard Business School uh, website and just search my name and you'll get to my faculty page and that lists articles and books and videos and various other things. Excellent. Thank you very much, Amy. You're very welcome. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast, and this is the Culture Lab team. Production manager, Lindsay Nunez. Art director, Emily Spencer. Aaron Scott, content editor. Sound producer, James Ead, Be Heard. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, you can do it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and many other places where podcasts are available. If you'd like to subscribe to my newsletter, The Culture Lab Insider, go to www.agabayer.com slash podcasts and scroll down to the very bottom of the page. That's www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to it. First, I just want to give a quick shout out to all the amazing listeners who keep leaving reviews on Apple Podcasts. Thank you. I haven't shared them for a while. So here's one from Dave from Australia. I'm so grateful I came across this podcast. It has given me a new language, understanding and appreciation for the role culture plays in organizations. I now have several more books on my to-read list. Thanks so much for creating it, Aga, a true godsend for my vocation and for my study. And Gazatena from the UK says, Aga hosts some wonderful conversations with a range of thought leaders around culture, leadership and high growth. Give this a listen. So if you love the Culture Lab, please review it on any of the platforms that you use because it really helps people find us and spread our message about the importance of company culture. And now it's time for the preview of the upcoming episode. And I'm so excited to let you know that our next episode will feature Aaron Dignan. 
Here is a little story to tell you about how much I love Aaron's work. When I started working with my editor on the content development of my new book, one of the questions she asked me was, what are the books that you wish you'd written yourself? And without any hesitation, I said, Brave New Work. Aaron is the founder and CEO of The Ready, and he and his team help companies, large and small, adapt new forms of self-organization and dynamic teaming. He's also the host of one of my favorite podcasts, Brave New Work, and clearly an author of one of my favorite books, Brave New Work. Here is Aaron speaking about how the pandemic can present us with a unique opportunity to rethink how we work. I think um, th there's a lot of tragedy happening right now that I'm feeling and, and holding, but, um, but I actually think that from a work perspective, there's a lot of promise in this moment. And so I think that this has been a forcing function for a lot of assumptions that we hold about trust and about remote work and about how we work um, to be challenged. And I don't, I don't have any illusions that we're going to come out of this and, you know, half the Fortune 500 is going to go remote and go pro autonomy and pro transparency or anything like that. But I do believe that a significant number of, of leaders are waking up and being like, hey, wait a second, we've been doing this for a month or two and the wheels have not fallen off the bus. And some things I thought were true are not true. And what else might be untrue that I'm committed to and, and, and attached to. And so I think of this as just this great moment of questioning and challenge that was forced upon us. Um, and I do believe, you know, as we if we get on the, you know, get on the line in a year, we will be in an environment where many more companies are experimenting with these ideas. Thank you for listening to this episode of Culture Lamp. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share it with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. <laughs>